started here. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you again for this time that you've given us, and we just ask that you would continue to watch over and protect us. May your word fill us. May your word protect us. Um, Lord, there's a lot of talk and concern about this coronavirus, and while I know that those things can be legitimate concerns, and I don't want to minimize that, we also know that you have told us that many will go before kings and and that the snakes would not bother them and all kinds of things that we know that we ultimately put our trust in you for everything. And so we do. We pray that you would uh, keep everybody safe and those that follow you and love you, that you would um, just be their, their protector, their healer, and uh, just teach us now through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well... We're going to, I do believe, cover some verses tonight. Um, I know you may not believe me, but uh, it is going to happen. So, I just, you're going to kind of see, I just have a couple of verses yet to show you that, that Jesus is God. Uh, Hebrews 1, 6 here, we kind of talked about this before, about being firstborn among the dead, how, how Christ was that, but... What I want to do is move on to verse 7. And in verse 7 it says, And of the angels he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame, flames of fire? And I, don't, I couldn't remember if we touched on this or not, but this is just a real quick point again that he's saying, makes his angels. You see, Yeshua Jesus is not made. He isn't a created being. He's eternal because he is God. But to the angels, he makes. Okay, He makes them. Uh, and so this is a, a contrast, again, showing that Jesus is better, higher than those angels. The other thing is, in verse 8, it goes on to say, but to the Son, okay, to the angels, and he's separating them, but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Now, what he's doing here is he is quoting. When he says, but to your son, he says. We often read this in the New Testament kind of thinking, well, all right, it's just more words. But you have to realize he's quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting Psalm 45 here. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So what he's doing all through this book is he's pointing us back to the Old Testament to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. He is God. Which is one of the reasons why it's so important that we as a church do not separate that old and new and say, oh, the old is this old covenant. It's kind of, you know, obsolete. It isn't. All of what these New Testament believers are doing are using it to lift up Yeshua Jesus. That's what they're doing. And so he's quoting Psalm 45, and you're going to see he just keeps quoting Scripture after Scripture after Scripture in Hebrews. So this isn't new. This isn't like, oh, brand new stuff here in Hebrews. No, it was already written. And now he's just trying to explain what was written. So what's interesting is God here speaks to God. Elohim speaks to Elohim. Again, showing Jesus was God. Okay? Oh God, your throne is forever. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you. So it's embedded all throughout the scripture. So this idea that Jesus is not God, which we hear from like Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons and, and many, some even Christians, believe it or not, it's completely unwarranted from both the New and the Old Testament. Isaiah 9, 6, it says here, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, unto the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
and of his increase and of his government and peace there will be no end. When it talks about his name, it gives a whole bunch of titles here, but one of them is Mighty God. I've got it in Hebrew, that's El Gibor. You go keep reading in Isaiah 10, the very next chapter, you see that exact same word, El Gibor, used to describe God the Father. And so here it's calling Jesus El Gibor. In chapter 10, it calls God the Father El Gibor. So again, saying this is God. And uh, by the way, this is a messianic passage here. Uh, we also see in chapter 7, verse 14 of Isaiah, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What's Emmanuel mean? God with us. Not a servant with us, not just the Messiah with us, but God with us. And so just even as, like, right in our front of our face, it's telling us this. Now, I, I underlined the word virgin there for a reason. You're going to hear a lot today with critics of Scripture trying to say that Jesus was not born of a virgin. This word virgin can simply mean a young maiden. Well, that is true, it can, but it also means virgin. And when we look at this context, plus the context of the rest of Scripture, clearly he was born of a virgin. Not to mention, when we look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, older than the Masoretic text that everything is translated from here. The Greek Septuagint clearly has the word virgin. No room for it to be a young maiden. So not only is he God, he was born of a virgin, hands down irrefutable. So don't buy into that because it is out there quite a bit that virgin doesn't necessarily mean virgin and that kind of thing. So I just kind of thought that was worth noting. In Genesis 28, verse 20, um, let me see here, is this changing? No. It says, Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread and eat clothing to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord, Yahweh, shall be my God. Now this is when, if you recall, Jacob is fleeing from his brother Esau. And he lays down at night and he puts a stone under his head. Even that's amazing. That, the stone that he puts under his head, I believe, is, is a picture of Jesus. The Jews see that as well. I'm not going to get into that tonight, but... Um, it's called Avon Hashatiah, the foundation stone. And it's not a stone, it's the stone that he places under his head. And when you look at the Hebrew and how it's worded, I can almost guarantee you that it was not just a regular stone. or It's just kind of like that rock that followed them throughout the wilderness. It was not just a rock. 1 Corinthians 10 says the rock that accompanied them was Christ. I think that's the same exact thing that we see here when Jacob puts that stone under his head. Maybe sometime later we'll talk about that. But for now, just kind of a little side note. But I have up here that same exact verse in the Targum. What's the Targum? Simply the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. All right. Now keep in mind Jesus spoke Aramaic and all of that too. So Aramaic, it's not some weird thing. We're not talking like the book of Enoch here. Okay, this is the Jewish scriptures just in Aramaic. And this is how it words this. And by the way, the Targum does this all over the place. It says, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If the word of the Lord will be my help. So the Targum, okay, it's saying, instead of God, the word. It replaces God. God with the Word. Now, we know what the Word is. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word is Jesus. And so even here, we're seeing in the Targum, and as, even in the second part, it says, the Word of the Lord shall be my God, instead of the Lord shall be my God. So even they are seeing this as a connection to Yeshua. As we move on here in Je Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. 
Now, there isn't a commentator that isn't going to tell you this is talking about Jesus, Yeshua. But it goes on, and it says, A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteousness. The word Lord there, anytime you see it in capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, is Yahweh. Okay, that's how you can tell that that's what it is in Hebrew. Okay, so the point is, is the Jews knew these scripture verses, and Jeremiah 23 is speaking about the Messiah, and it's saying the branch of righteousness, and now it's saying, but Yahweh is righteousness. The branch, it's that Hebrew word semek, and it's only used four times in Scripture. All of them refer to Jesus Christ coming. Uh, one of them being uh, when, uh, a, from the stump of Jesse, a branch will go forth. That word branch, it's the same semek that's used. And so we're connecting again Yeshua to Yahweh in this one verse. Moving on, we see here in Romans 9, 5, Christ came who is overall eternally blessed God. No beating around the bush. You don't need to know Hebrew. It's telling you Jesus is God. Titus 2, 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, it's right in front of our face. It's not hidden. It isn't something that uh, we need to know Hebrew and go to talk to scholars about. It is clear both in the Old and in the New. John 8, 56. I really like this one here. This is kind of neat. It says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That word in Greek here is ego aini, or aini, really, ego aini. And what's fascinating about that, to me, it's always, I used to read this, what happens next? They take up stones to throw at him. They want to kill him. So Jesus says, I tell you, I am. And they're like, kill him. What? Why? Well, because they knew their scriptures. And they knew that there is only one I am. And that was Yahweh, God, Elohim, the Creator. We see that from Exodus 3, verse 13. Remember Moses, the burning bush, he wants to know, well, God, who shall I say? To, who do I tell these people that sent me? How are they going to know that it's you? He says, Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What's his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Okay? They knew this verse. And so when Jesus declares it in the New Testament... It, was, it wasn't some subtle thing. That was, I'm God. I'm Yahweh. And that's why they wanted to kill him. It's that simple. Now, if I can get this to change here. Let me show you the Greek version of the Exodus. Okay, Again, the Septuagint, which, by the way, uh, Hebrews quotes most often when he is quoting it. It's quoting it out of the Septuagint most often. It says, God said to Moses, I am. Just to show you that Greek, ego aini, it's the exact same Greek word used in the Septuagint here in Exodus chapter 3. So there is no question in translation. Nothing is lost in translation. He's saying, I, I am he, ego aini. And when you look in 1 John, or John 8, 24, it says, before they tried to stone him, this is a little bit prior to this, he said, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I underline the word he there. 
The reason I did that is because it's not in the Greek. It's not in the New Testament. That word is not there. That's been added just for you to understand. So literally, what Yeshua said is, if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Literally, in the Greek, if you do not believe ego aini, you will die in your sins. So, very obvious what's happening here to these Jews when Jesus is talking. John chapter 20, verse 27, when he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands, reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. He knew that he was God at that point. There was no question about it. So anyway, those are just some things to kind of point out that Jesus is the Messiah. He is God. Um, so let's go on to verse 10. Boy, oh boy. Why can't I get this dumb thing to go? I think my batteries are about dead. Give me one second here. Hey, Terry, would you get me out of my drawer two double or triple A's? All right, well, we're going to read chapter 1, verse 10 here to kind of finish this chapter out. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak you will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same. Your years will not fail, but to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Now there is a lot in here that I love. Hmm. I don't know. We'll see what we can come up with here. Um, first of all, I like the fact that it says that you are the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and always. Malachi, I, I, the Lord, do not change. Now, isn't that kind of interesting? Because sometimes we see that there's an Old Testament God and there's a New Testament God. But he says, no, I, the Lord, do not change. I am the same yesterday, today, always. Here it says, you are the same. You are God. And so how can we have an Old Testament God and a New Testament God? See, God doesn't change. Now, His covenant, He has a new covenant, and we'll talk about that later, what new means. But keep in mind, we're talking about the same God. That's one thing I think is kind of important here. The other thing is, we kind of touched on this. By the way, He is quoting... Psalm 102 here, where, again, he's speaking of the Messiah, and here he's trying to point out, remember when you were reading Psalm 102? You were reading about Jesus. You were reading about the Messiah. And so in verse 13, he comes back and he says, who of the angels did he say, sit down? He comes full circle because we talked about this back in verse 3. In verse 3, it talked about he sat down at the right hand of God. Well, we had mentioned how priests didn't sit down. Okay, they, they couldn't sit down really until the last, the three o'clock sacrifice after that was all done, then they could sit down. And this is kind of showing when, when Yeshua was, was hanging on the cross and he says it is finished, it's then that he is able to go and sit down because the sacrifice was complete at that time. So it's just kind of coming full circle uh, seeing that here. Um, yeah, verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand? 
till I make your enemies a footstool. And that's from Psalm 102. 102. <coughs> so, we could get into some more, but what I want you to see is so far we have talked about a lot. We have seen Jesus is the Son of God, He is God, He is greater than the angels, He is the Creator. He's the one that calms the storms. Okay? He is the one that forgives sins. Over and over, what we were seeing is He is God. Okay, So now we jump into chapter 2. And here it says this. Therefore, that one word, that's as far as I'm going to get. What's that mean? It means because of everything I have just told you, Therefore, now you should listen to this. Does that make sense? So he has been building up all of chapter 1, and now he's saying, therefore, because of chapter 1, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Now this is important. That word drift away, I'm not going to get into it, but in the Greek word, it's the only time in Scripture this word is used. And it's very important because he's saying, if you don't understand chapter 1, you are in danger of drifting away. Eternal damnation. Okay? So that's kind of important. That's why we spent so much time on chapter 1. It's that important. If you don't understand that, it, you're in danger of drifting away. It goes on in verse 2, 4. If the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him? Now, I'm going to kind of dissect this in a few different parts. But first of all, what's the spoken, what was the word spoken through angels? What's he talking about there? Any ideas? Coming of Christ, being in the Messiah. That's what, I mean, you, we kind of think that that would be that. But I'll tell you, if you were a Jew, there was no wondering. You know why? Because the Bible told us. I'm going to kind of keep drilling this in your head. When we come up with a question, we often go to just our understanding but there should be a verse that pops up in our head to, exp to give us an answer. You know what I'm saying? Um, let me get, show you here. Acts 7.37 even tells us, This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, Now, by the way, this is when Stephen is about to be stoned, and he's giving basically a history of Israel. He says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. So we just saw, for if the words spoken through angels proved steadfast. What's the word? Well, Acts 7 is telling us that the word that the angel spoke at Mount Sinai, the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and, well, all of the law of God. Okay? It's not just here, but we also see in Galatians 3.19. What purpose, then, does the law serve? It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Okay. This is just Scripture interpreting Scripture. So when we go back and we see that in Hebrews, telling us this word that came through angels, you should be thinking the law. Okay. Now again, the Jews knew exactly what was going on here. Okay. They knew he was talking about the law. Now, what I want you to see is I've got two different colors here because 
this is also a structure. Remember I told you that before there was a structure in Hebrews talking about love your neighbor, or love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And that that structure is seen throughout Scripture. Here's another structure that's going to be seen in the book of Hebrews as well, co contrasting the Old Testament and the New Testament. He says, For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, in other words, if the law of God and every transgression and disobedience, every time you broke the command of God, you received a just reward. In other words, a just punishment. Okay, You broke the commands of God, you received a just punishment. God was not unjust in bringing it out. Okay, People all the time today tell me, you know, God was such an evil God in that Old Testament, He was an evil person because He killed all... No, God was not unjust in bringing destruction upon the ungodly. God can't be unjust. So, there's the contrast of the old. Now he brings in the new. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? New Testament, new covenant. See what he's saying? If you broke the old covenant and there was a just punishment. How much worse if you're going to break that covenant under the gospel of grace, the covenant of grace? Can you see that? There's a clear contrast here. Um, I've got some smaller verses here. This is just a side note somewhat. But remember, that I think the first week I said Clement of Alexandria said that maybe Paul wrote this, but Luke wrote it down, or, you know, Luke wrote what Paul said. And one of this, how he says it was confirmed to us, um, the same kind of words are used there in Luke 1, 2, in Luke's writings, so as a possibility of support for that. But uh, Ephesians 2 kind of backs up the content of this. It says, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In other words, Jesus is the cornerstone, but then the apostles and the prophets, the words that they teach, the words that were given to them are what are building on top of Jesus. Okay? Well, that's what Hebrews is saying here. When it says, at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. The apostles. Okay, who else heard him? Well, the apostles and the prophets. And so that's the kind of thing that we see here um, in those verses. But what I'd like to do is just give you another example of that pattern or structure that we see contrasting the old and the new. Look here in Hebrews 10. We're going to kind of fast forward to verse 28 there in chapter 10. It says, Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So, old covenant, you die under that law but of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? Can you see the contrast? That's what he's doing here in Hebrews 2. He does it again in Hebrews 10, and we can find this in other places in Scripture. But I just want you to see, this is the exact opposite of what the church is screaming today. Today, the church says, oh, you don't have to obey God. We're under grace. You obey God? Oh, that's legalism. That's not what Hebrews is saying. Hebrews is saying, yeah, I'll tell you what, you broke the commandments of God in the Old Testament, and you deserve death. You died without mercy. But now under the new covenant, how much worse is it going to be if you continue to live in disobedience, trample 
the grace of God, His mercy, His forgiveness. See the difference? The church is preaching a completely different message than this today. Now, maybe you want to say, hey, legalism, legalism. Take it up with God and His Word. Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what I say. Now, I'm not trying to put you under the law because, you see, I'm not talking about salvation here. In the Old Testament, yeah, if you disobeyed God, you could die. I disobey God all the time, every day, whether it be in thought or deed. I, am dis I disobey God. I am forgiven. But there is a difference between willfully sinning and being, being hateful of my sin. Paul himself said, the good that I want to do, I do not do, and that which I hate, I keep on doing. Right? But he said, the evil that I hate, I keep on doing. He hates it. Go ahead. I think in part, yes. Okay. And, yep, in part. But here's the thing. If people who reject Christ, are they going to obey the law of God? No. So, yes, he's talking about people who have rejected Christ. People, though, who trample, who are in the church and say, Jesus, forgive me. He, he, he forgave me so I can go live my life the way I want to. Exactly. And so that's why these things go like this. If you do believe in God, you're going to do what He says. That's what Jesus said. Now, you're not going to be successful. You're not going to be perfect. But you will have a heart to do for God. That's the difference. A heart to do. I love the way our... Jewish guide there in Israel, Ron, he, when we asked him, you know, somebody said something about Jews believe in God. He said, we don't believe in God. We know God. Because you see, the devil believes in God, doesn't he? he James says that the devil believes in God and shudders. So what's the difference between these people who say, well, I believe in God. How about Matthew, uh, where he talks about Many going before the Lord saying, Lord, Lord, we perform miracles in your name. We cast out demons. And he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I know not who you are. Depart, depart from me who? Worker of iniquity. Sinner. Okay? Somebody who's willfully sinning. Guys, I think that that's many people in the churches today are people who willfully live in sin in a disobedience because I'm under God's grace. And they're trampling underfoot the sacrifice of Jesus. They're not taking it seriously. These people aren't the atheists out on the street. These are people who are casting out demons, going to church every Sunday, calling on the name of Jesus. And they're the ones that he says, you're a worker of iniquity. Now, I don't think he's saying, oh, you broke one of my commandments because then we'd all be in that boat. What he's saying is, you willfully broke my commandments. You treated as something common, something that is amazing, the spirit of grace. Grace and mercy. And you treated it as if it was no big deal. You took advantage of it. Okay. I think we can see that in children sometime. I know in our own home. I mean, we can do all of these things and, and sometimes they'll start to take advantage and use, manipulate. Right? Would that, sorry, would that be Go like ahead. taking the Lord's name in vain, do you think, in one context? Or do you think that's more of just like using it as a curse word? I guess I've always had thought of that as we're using God's name in vain. Is that kind of like that? I think in a sense using God's name in vain is like that because of the fact that God says in one of the commandments... Do not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And so if, we're, if we don't care, and we're saying, oh my God, and we're not talking to God, that's using it in a vain 
way. And so that's breaking a commandment. Now, again, I'm not going to nitpick about this sin, this sin, because all of them are going to fall under this, the heart. If you know that you shouldn't be saying, oh, my God, when you're not talking to God, then I'd say, yeah, there's a problem in your heart. There are people who do it out there, and they're ignorant. They don't even realize that they're breaking a command of God. They don't realize that that's taking God's name in vain. So their heart isn't wrong. They're just ignorant. I'm sure there's a lot that I'm doing in my life that I'm ignorant of and just don't know any better. But you see, God knows my heart. And this is the thing, is God, and we're going to talk about this later, when the new covenant comes in, he says he's going to take this law of stone that was written on stone, and he's going to put it in our heart so we have a desire to obey God. And so that's why I don't really look at people's sins and say, oh, you're going to hell because, you know, you watched this bad movie the other day. Okay, maybe the Word of God needs to convict them and they, you know, but they're just living in, in ignorance and not taking it seriously in another thing that we'll be coming up to, basically. That that's kind of what can happen. But nonetheless, what we do see saying in Hebrews is this. Guys, this is kind of serious. This should, to some extent, put a little fear of God in us. And we've lost the fear of God in our society. He's just our buddy. He forgives us because I know Jesus. I prayed to him once. I asked him into my heart. Now I go live my life for me. That's just not right. This is going to kind of answer your question, Mark. Let's go to verse uh, 3 here, where it says, How shall we escape if we neglect um, such a great salvation? How shall we escape if we neglect? I want to focus on that word neglect such a great salvation. I think that's the problem right here. You know, Ray Comfort talks about this a lot when, as an illustration of what Christ has done for us, you get caught doing some terrible thing, you get arrested, you go before the court, the judge, he says you're going to go to prison for 20 years and you have a million dollar fine. And... If you can pay the million dollar fine, you won't go to prison. But you're thinking, I don't have a million dollars. And then somebody busts into the courtroom and says, I just went and sold my house, my car, everything I own. Here's a million dollars I want to pay for Caleb's fine. Okay, What are you going to think of that person? He's your new best friend. You're going to, what can I do for you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. What can I do? Can, can I go mow your lawn? Well, I just sold my house. I don't have a house anymore. You know, there's nothing you can do. Nothing. But you're going to have an attitude of gratitude for that person. I think that the gospel has become so mundane that we don't have an attitude of gratitude to want to serve God anymore. It's just like, Thanks for doing that for me, God. Now let me go live my life for me. That would be the same as Caleb saying, Hey, thanks, dude. Appreciate that. And going off and not caring about anything that that guy just did. And that's why that it's very important that we do not neglect this salvation. And as I was pondering, how are we neglecting such a great salvation? Well, I'll tell you, I had a long list of things. How many of us are reading our Bibles every day? My brother Wes, he has made a commitment this year to read the Bible all the way through every month. Every month. He's already on his third one going through. And he said it's amazing to see because, you know, it's taken me a year or sometimes two years to get through and... I get in this piece, but it makes no connection to this piece back here because that was six months ago. And so 
I said, well, how long does it take? He's reading like two and a half to three hours a day. He says, I get up early. I'll try and read an hour and a half in the morning and at night. Now, we might say, there's no way we'd have any time. But I'll bet that if you added up how much time people spend on Facebook or TV in a week, that you could get those hours. Now, I'm not saying you have to do these things. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is, is I think we have neglected such a great salvation. We don't understand the value of what He has done. But we're not in the Word like we should. We're watching so much TV. We're, you know, all of the sports and other programs and whatever else that we can do and want to do because we're neglecting what is more important to do what we want to do. And isn't that what neglect is? I mean, we can neglect our house and it needs painted for the last five years, right? We neglect things that we should be doing. Well, he's saying, don't neglect, set aside. You can live in it. It's there. It's always there by you, but it's not raised up as something important in your life. And I, I just think, if we truly believe this, when he's saying, hey, when you broke the commandments in the Old Testament, there was a severe punishment. How much more, if you're going to treat this holy, amazing grace and mercy as something common, as something unholy, how much more do we deserve God's wrath? As I think about that, and again, I'm not putting my, I know where I'm going when I die. I'm going to be with Jesus because He has forgiven me of my sin, but it still scares me. Not about salvation, but it scares me to think of what I'm losing. How I'm missing out. And how I'm living my life for me at times, rather than focusing on God. I don't know, I maybe told you this, I don't know, but just shortly before going to Montana, I told my wife, I said, man, I have been on cloud nine. I have been studying and studying and studying. I mean, every chance I get in the middle of the night, I wake up, I can't sleep. I'm praying or listening to a sermon. I mean, every free moment, I'm out cutting wood, I'm listening to a sermon. I am just engulfed in His Word. And I have been on cloud nine for the past couple, two, three months. And I told Tara, I do not want to lose this. I don't want to lose it. Because this is awesome. This is joy. And this is what Christianity is. So when I don't, when I neglect such a great salvation, I'm only hurting myself. You know, I'm the one that's losing out. Like, I don't want to lose this. I'm loving this. So, I, I think to me, anyway, this is kind of an important verse just for that purpose alone. Let me show you what James says here in chapter 4, verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Okay, so we're not to make friends with the world and neglect the gift of salvation. One of the things that uh, this kind of comes to mind is in Romans. In Romans it says, you are a slave to whomever you obey. Now guys, there's only, you know, in the world we kind of think there's black and white and gray. Not, God does not have gray. Matter of fact, I think I, there is no word for no, there is in Hebrew, but I've heard somewhere, maybe in Greek or something, I don't know. But bottom line is this, God sees things pretty black and white. There is truth, and if something is not true, what is it? False. It's not like, well, it's kind of true. No. It's not kind of a lie. It is, it's, if it's not true, it is false. That's it. When I took my true and false tests, and I put, you know, a question mark or a maybe or whatever, I got it wrong. It's the way it is. And so something is either true or it's not. So if we are not serving God, what are we doing? Yeah. 
the devil, you know what the devil wants? Worship. Okay, that's what he's always wanted from the beginning. And how does he receive worship? It isn't because we go to some satanic church and start singing, you know, the atheist song that uh, Tim Hawkins sang, you know. It, it, that's not how we worship. How do we worship the devil? Exactly. By disobeying God. That's the worship of the devil. What I want you guys to understand is how do we worship God? We often picture it as something just going and singing songs to Him, but that's not all of worshiping God. How do we worship God? Yeah, we live our life for Him. We obey Him. That's worship. Now, I don't always live, I'm not always worshiping God. Sometimes I do worship the devil. I know that sounds terrible, but when I walk in disobedience and I might have lustful eyes or greed or covetousness, the devil is getting that worship from me in that part of my life. Okay? Now, I, he doesn't, I don't belong to him, but he's, I'm giving him some, I belong to Jesus. But do you see what I'm saying here? And I think that's kind of what James is saying, is that you can't be friends with the world and at the same time be a friend of God. You have to be one or the other because you are a slave to the one whom you obey, Romans says. You're going to walk in disobedience? Well, then you're going to be a slave to the one whom you obey, a slave to the devil. Or you walk in obedience and you become a slave to Jesus. Now, again, I'm not talking about salvation here. I've told you, and I can't make this clear. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're going to get tired of me saying this. Okay, but I have to because of the culture we've grown up in. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm not talking about salvation. I know where I am going, but there are times I worship the devil because I disobey God. I'm forgiven. Okay, I am forgiven. That's why I'm getting to heaven. But that's not what I want. I want to worship God. And I think the reason I want that is because He has put His Spirit into my heart. He has put His commandments in my heart. He has put His Word there. And so I have a desire to do. I think that's what Paul said. I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For the good that I want to do is not the good that I do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. And if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me. Okay? And so I think that's what Paul is saying. Paul wasn't saying, oh, I can go live the way I want because I'm under grace. No, he says, I don't want to do that. I want to be different. I want to worship and serve God. I'm going to fail. That's why he ends it by saying, oh, what a wretched man I am. Who can rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus my Lord. So, like I said, you're going to get tired of me saying, you know, but, but to combat what the church has been saying for so many years and in so many ways of, we're under grace, I, I, we have to talk about this. But we talk about obedience today, and it just seems like it's naturally um, something that is, is called legalism. Hebrews 2.4, let's move on to the next verse. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. Okay, remember I, it was built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Okay, we just saw in Hebrews talking about confirmed, you know, through us basically. Here He's saying same thing, bearing witness the apostles, the prophets, bore witness about the truth of these scriptures with miracles, signs, and wonders. Part of that being the Holy Spirit. Okay, They were given that power. So it's basically saying, hey, yeah, this can be trusted. And there are many examples where we can see this. You know, Pentecost, we see them healing people, uh, you know, snakes biting them and, and, and just shaking them off into the into the fire as Paul did there on the island of Malta. 
So uh, many examples of this, but it says that these are to bear witness to the truth of these scriptures. Okay. Where at? According to his own will. Distributed according to his own will. I mean, that's kind of a. I mean, like, why would they put that word in there? I don't know, and I don't know how it's worded there in the Greek, but to me, I can see that God has given this. Uh, these are things that God has given, so God has distributed those things. Yeah. My ESV study Bible it has distributed also, and if I'm reading this right, in the, the notes down here in Greek would be like meriskos, which is distribution. Distributions. So, like, yeah. Like, and so, right yeah, to me it makes sense. Just God distributes these gifts. It's just I would say with the context of the whole New Testament. Um, you know, if a man's gift is prophesying, let him prophesy. But each man should do according to the measure given you, the measure of faith given you. And so when Romans talks about that, I would say it just it fits right in there, that these are all gifts, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, are things that are given to us by God. They're not ours. They're not our power. Uh, New King James. But I think you can even see it fitting in there probably. But yeah, this is New King James that I had up on the screen. Um, Acts 4.33 says, With great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So just another example of that, that. That's what we're seeing happening here. Verse 5. For he has not put the world to come of which he spoke, or of which we speak, in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man? that you should take care of him. He's talking about David here. He's quoting Psalm 8. And we recall David was looking up at the stars and, and just like, wow, who is man? Who am I that you are mindful of me? You know? And so he's just in awe of God's love and God's personal care for us. He says, or the son of man, that you take care of him. You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. And so he's kind of referring to another verse here in verse 8, putting all things in subjection under his feet. That goes all the way back to Genesis 1.28 when God told Adam, to subdue the earth, have dominion over it. So that when God created man, especially in their perfect state, they were to have dominion over all of creation. Well, Adam disobeys God, and does that mean that he wasn't saved? No, God had mercy. And what happens? So he lost that authority, and it was given to the devil. Now Jesus came to take it back. Now, we'll, we'll talk more about that later as well, but, um, but this is what he's talking about is here's man, you know, this all-powerful being, and then here's this man, who am I that you should care for me, the son of man? You, you made us a little lower the, than the angels, but it says, and you have put all things in subjection under his feet? You've given him all power and authority and dominion? So we know that David is talking kind of about himself in some senses, but this is also messianic and prophetic because it's also referring to the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, of which all dominion and power was going to be put under his feet. He's going to take back that dominion. Just to kind of show you some of this, though, but... We're heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. And Adam did lose it. However, when Christ came, he kind of, because of this restoration, has been giving that back to man. What does that mean? Well, look here at Luke 10, verse 19. Jesus said, Behold, I give you 
the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Maybe we should put coronavirus in there. Okay, I'm not saying that name it, claim it, and no, none of us are getting coronavirus because we love God. But what he's saying is we have that authority. We have God. And we need to put our faith in Him. 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Wow, who am I? Who am I? that I should judge angels. That's kind of powerful. You know, there's a verse that always bugs me a little bit. In Paul, he says this. He says, you know, you do not have many fathers in Christ Jesus. You have many guardians, but not many fathers. And the difference is, you know, a father is more strict and will tell you yes and no. He says, you do not have many fathers. But he goes on and he says, Therefore I became your father through the gospel in Jesus Christ. But he goes on and he says, Therefore imitate me. It's like, man, could any of you guys be so bold to say, I know Jesus enough, I follow God enough that I could say, imitate me, do what I do. You guys wouldn't be coming to my Bible study if I said that. <laughs> But Paul said that. Why? Because he had the authority of the Word of God. Okay? And yet, remember, he is also the one that said, all these things that I hate, I keep on doing. So it doesn't mean that you have to be perfect, but it does mean this. At least this is the way I see it. You better at least know the Scripture so you can tell people what to do. Okay? Okay? I give people advice all the time that I have a hard time doing myself, but I know it's right. I know it's the truth. And it's what I want to do. And in some cases, it's like, man, I'm really glad I'm not in your shoes, but this is what you should do. This is what I would try and do. And only by the grace of God would I be able to do it. But through Christ, I can do all things. And I think that's what he means by imitate him, is... I know what truth is. I have the word. I have that authority. Here it is. Just do it. Okay? If you fail doing it, get back up. Get back on that horse and say, thank you, Jesus, that you have forgiven me. But anyway, we're going to judge angels someday. How about Hebrews 2, 8 here again when it says, but now we do not yet see all things put under him. It continues there. In other words, it's not done. It's not complete. What do we not yet see put under him? I see kind of two main things, sin and death. Did Jesus conquer sin? Yes, but is sin still in the world? Yes. Did Jesus conquer death? Yes, but is death still in the world? Yes. But when he comes back, those things are no more. In Revelation, we see there is no more tear, no more fear, no more sin, no more death, no more anything bad. And that's why 1 Corinthians 15, 25 says here, says, he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. Again, quoting Psalm 8. Okay? And so that's why right now we're going to do what we don't want to do. Sin is still in this world, but I stand forgiven. But because of that great knowledge, I have every desire to want to know my Lord, my Savior, and know what pleases Him. Because how can I obey Him if I don't know what pleases Him? 
How are we going to know what pleases Him? There's only one way. It's not going to be from your heart and what your heart tells you. It's not even going to be probably what your church tells you. It's going to be what the Word tells you. That's how we please God. Okay? And by the way, Romans does kind of talk about that as well, about this is your, uh, oh, is that word? This is your good and perfect, pleasing will. I can't pull it up in my head right now. But it says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices to God, for this is your spiritual act of worship. Now, does that mean we're supposed to go build a cross and hang ourselves up on the cross? No. Offer your bodies holy and pleasing to God as this, this spiritual act of worship, a living sacrifice. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Well, how are we going to offer our bodies to God as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing? Well, we have to know what holiness is, first of all. Okay? It's kind of a truth-false thing. If it's not holy, what is it? Unholy. Pretty black and white, pretty common sense here. Okay? So it's very important for us to know God's Word and what is holy and what is not holy. Okay? We'll, we'll maybe talk more about that later. But again, he says this is your spiritual act of worship in Romans. He doesn't say, this is your means of salvation. This is your way of worshiping God. By obeying Him. Loving Him. Okay? So, um, Hebrews 2.9 but we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. Again, just kind of restating Jesus made a little lower than the angels just like, you know, we were. It says, but for the suffering and of death crowned with glory and honor. You know, when you think about Jesus and He suffered on that cross, that seems the most unglorious and unhonorable way to go. But it was a glorious and honor way that He suffered on the cross because He gave His life willingly for us. And it says that He, by the grace of God, might taste death. I got news for you. Any Jew reading this right now, where do you think their mind went? Tasting death. Maybe the Garden of Eden? Yeah. Now, I think I did a message on this at Lifehouse. If not, it's on a podcast for sure on the Garden of Eden. And I had talked about how Adam... I do not believe, fell into sin like accidentally, like, oh, thanks, Eve. <coughs> oh, and the devil's like, yeah, I got a two for one. No, <laughs> it was the devil went after Eve to get to Adam. And go listen to that podcast because it kind of talks about this. Adam, I truly believe, took the apple willingly because Timothy says Adam was not deceived. If you're not deceived, you must be willing. And I can back this up with many more scriptures on that podcast or the YouTube. Like I said, I'm not going to get into it. You go look at it. If, you, if you're thinking, ah, go watch it. But the bottom line is, is I believe that Adam, as a picture of Christ, ate willingly for his bride. Because that's what Jesus did. He tasted death for us because we broke his commandments. Just as Eve, the bride, broke the commandments. Adam took it. Took one for the team, you might say. 
Okay, which is why Romans says, nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not break a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. All right? So he's really starting to unravel. All right, therefore, since we've seen that Jesus is the Son of God, He is God, He's the Messiah. Remember the Old Testament, you got this law. Well, now, now that there's something even greater than that Old Testament, that Old Covenant, that old law written on stone, now that there's something greater and He has shown you His mercy, He has shown you His love, in a way that nobody else could, that He sent His only begotten Son to die for you. Let's not treat this as unholy and trample on it. This is what He's talking... I mean, that sums up what we've read here so far in Hebrews. He goes on here in verse 10. He says, For it was fitting for Him, for whom, are, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, again, going back to that Creator, in bringing many sons to glory. Hey, that's us. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The captain of their salvation, literally the word there is the originator of salvation. Salvation had its origin in Yeshua. The very word Yeshua, the Lord saves. Okay? I love this, though. How did he do it? He made things perfect through suffering. How do you think we make things perfect? Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 there. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same attitude or the same mind for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin or is done with sin, NIV says. I love that verse. He who has suffered in his flesh is done with sin. Guys, I'll tell you what, if we didn't live for the flesh, how many sins would we have? See what I mean about he who suffers in the flesh? Do you remember when Moses, when he takes the Israelites out of Egypt, they go to Mount Sinai. When they go to Mount Sinai, God comes down and he gives the Ten Commandments, right? And there's thunder and lightning and all this going on, and the people are scared to death because they have a healthy fear of God, something we've lost in the churches today. They have a fear of God. And they say to Moses, Listen, let him talk to you, but we don't want to hear it anymore. We can't do it or else we're going to die. So Moses goes to, to God and he says, hey, this is what the people said. And what's God's response? How dare they? No, he says, the people are right. The people are right. If God continued to speak to them in their unholiness and whatnot, they would die. You see, guys, the Word of God, it's so powerful. It should be so powerful to us. You know what it's supposed to do to the flesh? It's supposed to make us tremble. The flesh, not the spirit. The flesh. It is supposed to make our flesh tremble. But do you know what is happening in churches today? The Word is trying to make the flesh feel pleasant and desirable, and make you feel good about yourself, about whatever. What can I get if I come to church? No, 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 no. The purpose of that word is to kill the flesh, not feed it. It feeds the spirit, but it's supposed to kill the flesh. And I think that's what 1 Peter 4, 1 here is talking about. He who has suffered in the body, the flesh, is done with sin. If I don't live for myself all the time and I'm not so worried about, okay, what am I going to get out of this? But when I go to church, it's not, okay, what am I going to get out of it? But Lord, I'm here to worship and praise you. I'm here to give to you. 
I'm here to serve you by serving others. I am giving of my flesh. I die. I think that's what it's talking about here. And so when it says, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering, that's the example Christ gave for us. He didn't live for himself. He wasn't, what do I get out of this? For God so loved the world, you, that he gave his only begotten son. Okay, As a lamb you know, was led to the slaughter, as, as, as one is silent before his shears, Jesus was led before you know, those who slaughtered him. That's what it's talking about here. And so he's gone from, wow, such a great salvation that you have. Don't trample on it. But not only don't trample on it, but look at his example. Look what he did for you. Verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. Now, by the way, let's look at that word sanctify again. That's different than the word justify. Justify is salvation to be made right with God. Sanctify is to be made holy, to, to walk with God, to obey Him. That's sanctification. So those who are being sanctified are all one, for which reason He is not ashamed to call them brothers. Okay, so He's not ashamed to call them brothers. Why? Because they're being sanctified. They're walking a sanctified life. They're there are those who walk with God. There are those who obey Him that He's not ashamed to call brothers. If you're not being sanctified, He doesn't say perfect. You're being made perfect. You're being sanctified. You're a work in progress. You're a brother. But if you think you've got it down, oh, I'm under grace. Now I'm going to go live my life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. Where's the sanctification in that? Absolutely. What you just explained, um, I think, truly describes what it means to put the nail in one's hand. Instead of just the purpose of saying, OMG, I think it's the more flippant view to proclaim his name over your life and to live in such a way that, that does not represent that at all. Yeah, I, I would agree. Just to so that people can hear this, taking God's name in vain isn't just saying the word, but it's living a life unworthy of the calling. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's both, but yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I agree it's both. Yeah. I think it's so much deeper than just saying yeah. the word. Verse 12 here says, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. I, I'm a, just, this part just kind of amazes me. He who sanctifies God and those who are being sanctified, us, are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, us. He calls us brothers, saying, I'll declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise, sing praise to you. Now, he is quoting Psalm 22 here as well again. Um, so Psalm 22, another messianic passage, very clear. If you go read it, it's the one where it talks about him, you know, his bones are all out of joint. He's been pierced. His hands and feet have been pierced and bull strong bulls of Bashan are surrounding him, all of that kind of thing. But there's a kind of a dual thing here. We're brothers. We are, God is going to proclaim our name in the assembly. Did you know that? In Revelation, I think it's chapter 3, verse 5, he says he will proclaim our name before his Father in heaven. By the way, that's what, if you recall that, that same message about the Garden of Eden, that's what Adam does as a picture of Christ. The very first recorded words in Genesis there that Adam ever says. Okay? He maybe said other things that's not recorded, but what's recorded is you are called woman. Okay, in other words, 
God brought Eve to Adam, just as God, the Father, brings us to Jesus. No one comes to Jesus unless the Father draws him. He brings the bride to Christ. And then what happens? He proclaims her name, the bride's name, before his Father. That's, I see a picture of that right here. Right? I think that's the, the assembly of believers, basically. In the midst of the assembly, all the, the saints, the, the, the apostles, probably even the angels. But in, in heaven, right? Yes. Yep. The heavenly, like heavenly assembly. Not, not, not the assembly of God's church. Yeah. <laughs> but again, but keep in mind. Not on earth. I mean, it isn't the church, the invisible church. It's the, the church in heaven. I mean, right. the believers. Okay. Yes. Now, keep in mind, though, this is also coming from Psalm 22. And it's talking about Jesus, too. And God does this to, for, for Jesus. Okay, He is giving glory to, to Jesus for, for all of that as well. So there's a dual thing here. So don't just put this as us. This is also clearly speaking of the Messiah. So, um, Verse 13. And again, I will put my trust in Him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Now, he's quoting Isaiah 8. Okay? And it's talking about Emmanuel there, and basically a warning in some senses as you read the chapter, not to neglect or reject him. So, again, these are verses that they would have known, their minds would have gone to, to that portion of Scripture in Isaiah, and they would have realized they were reading about themselves. He's warning them, because you've seen this is the Messiah, because he has died, don't neglect this, because if you do, there is judgment. That's how serious this is. And so you can go read Isaiah 8. Here's a little portion of it in verse 14. Again, speaking of the Messiah, he will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble. goes on here, just to skip a little to verse 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will hope in him. I love this. Okay, clearly again, Isaiah 8, go read it all. But you're seeing, it's talking about Jesus being a, the stumbling stone. Okay, we see that quoted in, in the New Testament as well in other places. But he goes on and he says... Many among them shall stumble. Just like he's been preaching to these Hebrews, he says, don't stumble, don't fall apart, don't drift away, don't neglect this gift, don't stumble over the stumbling stone. Okay? That's what he's saying. And he says, bind up the testimony. What's the testimony? The law of God. Seal the law among my disciples. Again, this is talking about Jesus. Now, wait a minute. Why Jesus got rid of the law. No, as a matter of fact, it's saying you're supposed to seal the law among the disciples. And then in verse 17, and I will hope in him. Now, that word seal in the Greek Septuagint, okay, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, is the exact same Greek word used here in Ephesians 1.13 when it says, in Him, in Jesus, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed, not with the law, but sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In other words, what you're going to see in Hebrews is going to continue to unfold this is God never got rid of, of the law. The law is not gone. He just sealed it in your hearts. Romans chapter 2, I think it is, talks about this, that the, our minds and our consciences will bear witness against us on the day of judgment because he has put the law in our hearts. That's in Romans. And so here in the Old Testament, he says, seal the law on my disciples. What's he talking about? I think Ephesians is filling it by the Holy Spirit being placed and sealed in you 
that his law is now in your heart, not on this stone, not as a, a, a something that condemns and kills, but as something that is a means of worship and praise and a desire for your heart to love God. But we are sealed, I believe there very clearly, the law of God. The Holy Spirit puts that. What is the law of God? His Word. His Word is to be in us. It is to be in our mouth. It is to be, you know, in our minds. It, it's, it's just the Word of God. But I am going to propose that the church has a wrong view of the law of God. We see it as some, uh, you know, just you got to, it, it's something that beats us down. Not a blessing, but a curse. Well, there was a curse of the law, but even in Romans, he says, what then should we say? Is the law bad? Certainly not. He says the law is good as long as one uses it properly. Romans. Okay? And that's what Hebrews is going to show you, is that law can be legalism. And that's when it's used improperly. When it is condemning you, now, it may need to condemn you a little bit because maybe if we're not believers in Christ, if we're not there, that law is to convict you, to be a tutor, to show us, you know, truth. But Romans says that the condemnation of the law has been taken away. Not the law itself, but the condemnation of the law. And again, this will become... This will be unfolded just right here in the book of Hebrews. Let's uh, close out here with verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So we see, first of all, only he can defeat the devil, not you. Even the archangel Michael, it says in Jude, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against the devil. You know, I see people kind of mocking the devil and making fun of him. Don't do that. Okay? You call upon Christ. You call upon him and his word to go after the devil. You don't. Okay? Christ only can do that. But um, this other thing, the fear of death can be overcome by the promises of God. You know, somebody asked me, I don't know if it was yesterday or today, what, what scares you? And I had to think about it, and I thought, nothing. I'm not <coughs> saying that I won't be scared at times. If somebody stuck a gun to my head, I'm sure there's going to be, my flesh is going to be there to be scared of. But yet at the same time, I'm not scared of that. I'm not fearful of that. I'm not fearful of dying. I'm not fearful of cancer. I'm not fearful of anything anymore because of the promises of God. I know where I'm going. If God allows me to get the coronavirus and it makes me die even, I'm okay. I'm not fearful of that. And I'm not going to let fear control my life. God says we do not have a spirit of fear, but we have a spirit of sonship. And by Him, we cry, Abba, Father. And so right now, we're seeing a pretty good example of people in our communities, in this world right now, living in fear. And I'm not saying there isn't wisdom and things, so don't, don't take me wrong here. But I also see fear. I see people panicking. And we can't do that. We, we have promises. Let's grab hold of those things. And just think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or many other examples that we could talk about. I think because we are so fearful that many of us would bow down. Because... Well, it's not a big deal. I'm under grace anyway. Okay? I, I think we, 
but if we fear God with it, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of God is a good thing, even as a New Testament, grace-filled, sanctified, blood-covered uh, saint of Jesus Christ. Fear of God is a good thing. I have a healthy fear of Him, just like I had a healthy fear of my father. I loved him very much. But that's the kind of fear that we should have of God, and I think that has been stripped away. And if we have that kind of fear of God, we have a faith in God, and that faith drives out fear of the world, fear of the devil, fear of all the unholy things that we shouldn't be fearful of. So anyway, um, fear of death can be overcome by the promises of God. Any thoughts anybody has here? It's in Jude. I did kind of quote it. I said it here before, yeah. But it's good to hear it again. But verse uh, 9, but even the archangel angel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. It's just kind of this is, I guess this kind of backs up what you were saying from the original verse. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, Anything else? I didn't even look at the watch or the clock, and it seems like I did take you maybe a little longer than normal, but I just thought I want to kind of try and get that thought process done. And so, well, we'll close in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for, for being our salvation. Thank you so much. Father, I just pray that you would put what you have done on that cross, what your love for us has been, that it would be on the forefront of our minds so that we would not trample that, that we would not treat it as something common, that we would not treat it as something ordinary, but that we would see it as what it is, a love that is greater than anything that I can imagine, a sacrifice greater than any that I have done or could imagine. And we ask that you would help us, Lord, to live for you, that we would... Do what is holy and pleasing in your sight, not what we think is right, but what you have said is right, that you would uh, continue to give us an understanding of that mercy and grace so that we would not live a life of lawlessness, a life of iniquity. And so thank you, Jesus, for taking away that condemnation, and may you just put in our hearts a desire to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.